We would like to welcome you to our new series on the book of Daniel, where God reveals the future history of mankind. Now, Daniel tells us we are in the last moments of human history and concludes with God's redemption of mankind. We invite you to stay with us. We know you will be blessed. I'm reminded of how much I need to know You are for me, you're not against me You are with me, I'm not alone Through all the darkest times and brightest days I know some things will always stay the same I'm We are so glad to be with you today. Uh, we have some really exciting a uh, very intense, extraordinarily fascinating presentation for you in Daniel chapter 9. But we're going to review Daniel 7 and 8 to bring you up to speed. You'll want to take notes on this presentation if you possibly can, because we are going to th show you the three most significant time prophecies, I think, in all of Scripture. So you hang on. We are excited about this presentation. Let's go to our picture that Sherry brought us north coast of California, just north of San Francisco. Beautiful ranch sitting out in this meadow right on the bay. And there's a trail that you can park and hike along the ridges there and down through that beautiful valley. And just to the left someday, we'll have to show you a small herd of elk cows just grazing amongst the flowers and the grass. That is just to the left of this picture. So thank you, Sherry, for bringing that to us. Hope you enjoyed it. Let's jump into faith and hope for today. Daniel 9, part 2, the future. And remember, we are going to review for you Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8 to set the stage for Daniel 9. So here's the vision of Daniel 2. Babylon was the empire of gold, the Medes and Persians, Medo-Persia, silver on the chest, uh, Greece was the brass empire, Rome, the iron, that monster you'll meet in a moment. Then there were ten toes and the mixture of iron and clay. And I'm just going to tell you as a uh, uh, ceramist that I, I just want you to know that when you have iron in your clay and you fire it in the kiln, it blows up your vase or your platter or whatever it is you're making. Iron and clay are disastrous. That is what the end of time looks like. It is the time in which we live. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And then this picture you're looking at, there's a stone that is coming, that's cut out of a mountain, going to hit the feet of the statue and will establish Christ's kingdom. So Daniel 2 is the rise of five kingdoms. God establishes his eternal kingdom. Now, Daniel chapter 7. Again in this vision, the lion, Babylon, is the head of the first of the empires. And in that vision, the wings fall off and the lion stands up and has the heart of the man talking about the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar. Followed by the bear with the three ribs, the Medes and the Persians, Medo-Persia. Then there was the leopard with four heads and the wings. Now keep in mind, when Alexander the Great died, Greece was divided up by his four generals. Then we have pagan Rome, that monster that is unbelievable, that was this whole vision. When we come to pagan Rome and the little horn causes Daniel such anxiety and he, he's just perplexed by it. Then there's the emergence of Christian Rome, the little horn power. Now here's what's unique about this horn. It is a political power, as all things beastly are. But it speaks religious things and does religious persecution. And it emerges during the instability at the end of the history of mankind as iron and clay mixed together. And that little horn power, you're going to learn a couple of things in review here in just a moment. So, in Daniel 7, we have five kingdoms. 
One of those five is a horn. That horn becomes a persecuting power. A judgment comes before the great stone brings down the empires of man and God establishes his eternal kingdom. Now keep in mind, this is review. So in Daniel 7.25, it says, And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a times. Now in review, when we studied this chapter, we explained that the word time in Hebrew is a way of saying a year. So times would be two years, a half a time would be a half a year. So that is three and a half years. Now, prophetic time, understanding prophecy, Numbers 1434, according to the number of days, God said to Israel, which you spied out the land 40 days, for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. That was because Israel corporately rejected the good news that the 12 spies brought back, and they did not take possession of the promised land. And there was a consequence. There was a judgment for them. So they had to wait 40 years at the border before they went in. Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Ezekiel is at the gate of Jerusalem, and he's making a prophetic statement to all the people that come and go out of the city. And here's what Ezekiel 4 says. I have assigned it to you for 40 days, a day for each year. Now, if you take this principle and apply it to the prophecies we are going to study, an amazing thing happens. They come right on time. Are you ready for this? Okay, let's jump right in. So this little horn power ruled for three and a half days, prophetic years, for 1,260 years. That is a time, a 360 day year, times 720 days, a half a time, 180 days or years, or 1,200 prof uh, prophetic years, 1,260 prophetic years. That era happens to be known in history as the Dark Ages. Did you know that? This little horn power ruled during this era. Now, here's what I want to make an important connection. This same prophecy is repeated in Revelation, in Revelation 12, verse 6. It is the same time prophecy taken from Daniel and placed so you get a more complete picture of this prophecy happening in the time of the end. The woman, the church, is fleeing the persecution of the little horn power. Notice what verse 6 says in Revelation 12. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days, or prophetic years, the Dark Ages. Now, as we come to the end of that 1260 uh, year period of time, in France, at the end of the Dark Ages, in the 1790s, was the French Revolution. The French Revolution, now pay attention to the slide, the rejection of religion in France came as a result of the abuses of the state church. Now let me explain something. Christian religion became more and more and more judgmental, became more legalistic, and increased unbelievable persecution of fellow believers. Now, at the end of the Dark Ages, the Pope was arrested by General Berthier in 1798 during the French Revolution, which was driven by atheism, which is the rejection of religion. Spiritual abuse, emerged in every nation when kings became the head of the church or when bishops become the head of the state. The gospel is that we are called to live by faith alone. We are not called to be under the control of religion and civil power. We are to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Living by faith makes us subject to God, not the state. And when that mixture of church and state came together, 
it created what is known as the Dark Ages. And there's a darkness that results from that marriage of those two forces. Now, historians estimate religious wars during the Dark Ages took the lives of somewhere between 30 and 50 million people. Now, let me explain those two numbers. 30 million are conservative historians. 50 million are liberal historians. So the truth must lie somewhere in between. But they're not far off. The Inquisition also took the lives of thousands. Persecution of martyrs also becomes part of the fulfillment of this prophecy during the Dark Ages. Religion wasn't really very nice because living by faith got replaced by living by duty and then who defines the duty creates persecution. It is the opposite of living by faith alone in Christ. So the little horn power reigns until the time of the end and at that time the judgment of the saints begins. Now going back to Daniel 7 21 and 22 listen carefully I kept looking and that horn was waging war against the saints, the dark ages, religious wars, and overpowering them, verse 22, until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in the favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So this prophecy tells us that there is persecution and at the end of that persecution, which ended in 1798, a judgment occurs or begins. Did you catch that? It's profoundly simple. This is not complicated. Now let's review Daniel 8. The, Med and er um, sorry, the Medo Persian Empire has defeated Babylon. The vision in Daniel 8 shows Daniel the defeat of the Persian Empire and the rise of Greece. Now pay attention. This vision also reveals to Daniel the little horn power that is coming following the Greek Empire. And I have a speculation I want to just throw out here. I personally believe as the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire brought to us what we have in America known as a democratic republic, that out of that democratic republic political system, you will see in the book of Revelation especially, will be again the rise of the merger of church and state happening in democracy. And that is why this vision perplexed Daniel so much. In Daniel 8, let's look at verses 9 to 14. Just want to walk you through them. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven. That little horn claimed equality with God. And it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Persecution. Verse 11. He exalted himself, that's the little horn, as high as the prince of the host. In other words, he claimed to be equal to Christ. When you hear religious leaders of any organization, any denomination, claiming equality with Christ or to claim to be Christ on earth, you should pay attention. He exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Wow. Verse 12. Because of transgression, that's rebellion, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. That's the intercession of Christ, because they have created a substitute intercession. And he cast truth to, down to the ground, which means tradition replaced biblical truth. He did all of this and prospered. Verse 13, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation and the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now that's Day of Atonement language. On the Day of Atonement, the sins were removed from the sanctuary. But now we're not talking about just an earthly sanctuary. We are talking about the sanctuary in heaven that the earthly one was modeled after. The 2,300 days 
prophetic years is the longest time prophecy in Scripture. Our second time prophecy comes in Daniel 8, the first one in 7, second one in 8. Okay. The simple key to understanding prophetic time, the Bible says one day is one year. Numbers 14.35 and Ezekiel 4.6 show us the principle of understanding prophetic time. Daniel 9, the coming of Messiah the Prince. Listen to this time prophecy carefully. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's the heavenly most holy. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and tell Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times as the res restoration of Jerusalem. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Now, I told you, this is a messianic prophecy. And at the end of that 69 weeks, in the midst of that last week, the 70th week, the Messiah is going to be cut off. That means he's going to come and he's going to be cut off. So Daniel 9, 25. So you are to know and discern from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and tell the Messiah there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now we know Artaxerxes issued that command for the restoration of Jerusalem. That happened in Ezra. It's 457 B.C. when that decree was given, and how do we know that is right? Because when you take that date and lay out the timeline, it comes perfectly to the cutting off of the Messiah, flawlessly. And it's the only date that makes this prophecy work on a correct timeline. So here's what it looks like. 457 B.C., Artaxerxes' decree to rebuild and tell Messiah the Prince there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then you have that final week, and something happens in the middle of that week. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off and have nothing. And in the midst of that week, Christ is crucified. In AD 27, right on time, is the baptism of Christ, the arrival of the Messiah. Three and a half years in his ministry, it ends and he is crucified. The Roman Empire puts him to death. Then we have three and a half years that follow, and that is the stoning of Stephen. And who is standing there holding the robes while Stephen is being stoned? None other than Paul himself, who is about to meet Jesus in a vision, and he takes the gospel to the Gentiles, A.D. 34. This prophecy happens right on time. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So in the middle of the week, the Messiah will be cut off, and he's going to make a covenant with many and end the sacrifices. Now that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Just take and, and ponder that for just a moment. Now, I know that there's more than one interpretation of this prophecy, and I know that it's been being interpreted uh, in A.D. and in B.C. by a number of different people who claim to have the gift of interpretation. I, I just simply want to say that the 457 B.C. date and the principle of a day for a year make this prophecy flawless. They make it come right on time. It's not even up for dispute. Now, some people will say, well, you know, it's Antiochus Epiphanes, and you've got to re recreate the numbers, and they go on, and all these reasons why it's Antiochus. But did you know that when you try to insert Antiochus Epiphanes with literal days, it doesn't even arrive correctly on his timeline? It isn't even close to being correct? This 
friends, is the only interpretation that comes to the year flawlessly. Quite a powerful message, actually. It says in Daniel 9.26, Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war and desolations are determined. Verse 27, And he shall make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offerings. So, Daniel 8, 9 to 14, perfectly fits in this story. And he said to me, For 2,300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. That's a coming judgment, day of atonement judgment. The vision of the evening and mornings, which was told is true, therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. So the 2,300 days is not going to come in the time of Antiochus. It's going to come off into the future to the time of the end. So I've given you three time prophecies today. Daniel 8, 14 and 17, he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. That vision refers to the time of the end, verse 17. Now, if you look at that big blue line across the bottom of the screen, from 457 B.C. to 1844, is 2,300 prophetic days of years. Now, if you look to the left, there's a dark blue 490 days of years with one week in which the Messiah is cut off. That is the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. But do you see there in bright red, 1,260 day for a year prophecy, the reign of the little horn? We have that, and it comes into play about 538 when the early Christian church began to take absolute power and the bishop of Rome takes the position as the head of the Christian Roman Empire, that 1,200 years of the Dark Ages ends in 1798, just before 1844. There's all three of the time prophecies perfectly laid out in Daniel 7, 8, and 9. Now that is absolutely amazing. Here's what's, to me, startling about this. Everything comes right on time. Everything as clearly as what the Bible said. In other words, the purpose of prophecy isn't to be a calendar as a way of predicting. It is to give you a, re a revelation to show you that God actually knows the beginning from the end to strengthen your faith in him that he tells you what is coming so that you can be ready for his return. That yellow bar at the end is uh, sort of a temporary symbolic symbol that that's when the vindication of the saints begins, which means that we are living in the time in which Christ is ministering on behalf, removing the sins that have been confessed, so that when he returns, he knows you. What I tried to tell you on this slide is that the time of the end, the judgment of the saints begins. Now, I want you to notice that when we talk about judgment here, we're not talking about a lake of burning fire. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 22, we're talking about judgment is all about your vindication. It says, and he found judgment in favor of the saints. You see, the judgment, our message of Revelation 14 is that you have been vindicated so that when Christ comes, he knows who you are as the Messiah. All three of those prophecies are given to one man, Daniel. They're repeated, that 1260 day is repeated for us again in John's book, The Revelation. So we are dependent on Daniel and Revelation to clearly reveal the prophetic timeline God has 
for the completed work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Remember, the earthly sanctuary was modeled after the heavenly. There was an annual day of atonement every year, the blotting out of sins. We are now living in the antitypical or the prophetic day of atonement in which Christ is blotting out the sins and vindicating every person who's ever confessed a sin. See, the judgment, also known as the heavenly audit, is found in the books of Leviticus, Daniels, he, Daniel, Hebrews, and Revelation. Daniel tells us that judgment is about finding in favor of you. A saint is a believer. It isn't a statue. It's a living, breathing human being. And the judgment has found, been found in your favor. Now let's just think about that for a moment. A lot of people are terrified of how judgment has been presented as this terrifying thing that God can't wait to burn you up. What I am telling you today is exactly the opposite. I'm trying to tell you that God can't wait to remove every confessed sin you have ever had and blot it out and remove it permanently so you never face it again. The judgment hour message is exactly the opposite as millions of people have been taught, that judgment is the best news in the whole world so that you may have faith in Christ's ministry as your intercessor in the heavenly realm. That he is not only on your side, but he is the savior of the world and he has already vindicated you. The question is, will you accept freely his gift of vindication? That's why we call him the Messiah. Isn't that good news? I mean, what would happen if every Christian had this much joy knowing that they did not enter into the judgment facing fear? Don't you think a lot more people would go to church? Don't you think a lot more people would want to go to church? I believe that is the case. I think sometimes we have done a disservice in how we approach the judgment hour message because we don't spend enough time in Daniel which is filled with good news, and it's a book that is relevant to you and me today. Best news in the whole world. I want to go to our closing picture today that Sherry brings us. These are the Tetons. We're in eastern Idaho. We're looking there at the Tetons just over the border in Wyoming. And, oh my goodness, those mountains are so huge and so big. It's just in June. It's just late summer. Thank you, Sherry, for taking us there for a few moments. Would you go back and just take a few minutes and spend with God today? Thank you for watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho 83303.